Up until now, we have been thinking of design mainly around the idea of an object. That is, we looked at the object as the center of design and its analysis. In such an approach, which we will call object-oriented design, the main influence of design begins and ends with the use of a certain object. The use of it is related or even conditioned by its design. Its design is manifested in its aesthetics, the shape, form, material, texture of an object, and in its functionality, how we use it and for what purpose. We saw that the design of an object sometimes shapes and sometimes reinforces certain ideas we have about ourselves, about others, and in this sense the object itself is seen as a medium for meaningful cultural and social messages. In a system where there is a set relationship of roles between producers and consumers. As such, the designed object could be seen as a mediator or a vertebra in the social construct. The purpose of this unit is to take another look at design and think about design beyond the object itself, as an isolated and separated unit. This approach aims at understanding how design is a social process. As such, it is dynamic, ever-changing and mutable. In this metaphor, what is designed is far more than the object itself. In fact, the object in this way is seen as a node or as a point in a complex network of interrelations that are mutually and not exclusively affecting each other. To understand this kind of approach, we can think of the designed object as a path in a communication network, or to use a fruitful metaphor, we can look at the design object as part of an ecology. We are used to think of ecology in the context of the human relationship to nature, but in fact, the definition of the term looks to identify complex networks of interrelations with multiple participants, each contributing in its own way to the shaping and the balancing of the system as a whole. To think of design as an ecology or as a process is challenging, as it requires us to always look beyond the object itself and understand how it is shaping the system that it is embedded in. How such a system changes design itself? At the same time, just like in ecology, it is more difficult here to identify a specific individual responsible for the end result of design. However, the ethics that emerge from such an approach consider the designer not only as the creator and conductor of aesthetics, form and shape. The designer here has a responsibility towards a wider context which includes a diverse set of stakeholders apart from the consumers themselves. To understand this, firstly let's try and identify the different players of the design process from this broader perspective. This way we may attain a global vision of the system created around an object and sense this difference in approach that will lead us through the next units. Firstly, we can already understand that the design process cannot be located to one specific geographical location. In this sense, the design process takes place across numerous platforms. However, in each of those platforms, we can find the four pillars of the design process. The first pillar is the designer. This may not be a single individual. In fact, in most companies, designers work in teams who together manage the process that we can define as the creative invention. The second pillar we can name the client. Again, here we might not speak of one individual, but of a network of affiliates who are managing the monetary logistic around the process and its resources. The third pillar is the producer. This refers to those networks who take the idea from theory into practice. Finally, the fourth pillar in the design process is the customer. If in previous approaches to analyzing design the customer was regarded as a mere consumer, that is a passive agent in the process of creating the designed object, here we will see an increasing consideration of the user as an active force in shaping the process of design, especially when processes of design are examined from a historical perspective and lineages or traditions of design can be recognized. Each of these pillars, as we can already see, includes a variety of individuals across different professional milieus and different interests and needs. For example, if we look at the production department, we will find it includes engineers, scientists, operation managers, production line workers, miners of natural resources, etc. Very much like in an ecological system, each of them has an influence on the design process as a whole. At the same time, the lives of each of these individuals are deeply influenced and affected by the process of design in different ways. So how to describe such a process? 
where to start is already an interesting theoretical question. One may start with the client, thinking of it as the main agent or propeller of the design process. This position is given to it by its power of initiating the process and providing the financial framework for the new invention. However, if we would like to complicate things a little further, we may ask where the need for such a new invention stems from. To answer this question, we may need to go all the way back to the end of this chain and speak about the customer, or even better, the social construct that requires a solution to a seeming problem. However, this problem in itself can sometimes be traced back to certain design histories, objects, goods, ways of living that requires development and maintenance. The development of the market in this sense is perpetual and it is difficult to underline the starting point. Therefore, we have to rethink of the idea of the production line and realize that it is not a line at all. Maybe we can start by thinking of it as a production circle. The circle allows us to start the process of design in any given point on it in order to examine how the different stakeholders interact. At the same time, as we build the relationships between the players, we will probably notice that not all influences are straightforward and linear, one leading to another in an orderly fashion. That is, one factor may not necessarily influence another which is adjacent to it on the circle. So finally, in trying to imagine how such a chain of reaction may look like, in reality, we will probably remain with a complex net and watch one which is in constant move, while the changing of one node in the system may affect the system as a whole. Now you may ask, but why complicate things? Weren't we happy with analyzing objects as they are? It is clear that such a perspective is theoretically and practically challenging, and maybe even impossible to fully comprehend and contain. So, what do we gain from such an inquiry? Well, it is our hope that the following units will answer this question through examining different aspects of understanding design as process. In the next lecture, from designing objects to designing situations, we will examine how and why designers are increasingly made aware of the situation constructed around objects and the importance of such an awareness in creating better designs. Other lectures in this unit will demonstrate how design changes our body and what it is capable of doing, how design is constructing social orders that are already embodied and manifested in our bodily gestures, our posture, with a noticeable effect on physiological systems. In considering the different stakeholders of the production networks, we may start to think about how a designed object has a profound importance in shaping the lives of whole communities who do not necessarily have direct access to the object produced. This will further widen our understanding of the social and political aspects of design. Finally, as expected in a unit looking at ecologies of design, we will inquire into the design process and its direct influence on natural ecological systems, global warming and energy crisis.